Today I'm interviewing uh, Gled Siporski. Did I get your name right? You got my name perfectly right. Okay. Um, and he's the coordinator of the Pro Tru- the Pro Truth Pledge Project, which is part of the Rational Politics Initiative, which he's also the coordinator of. Um, so both Cliff and I have taken the Pro Truth Pledge. Um, yeah. Basically, <laughs> so get, get for us um, to basically share, honor, and encourage the truth in all that we do. And um, I basically have a few questions that. Um, I'll be asking Gleb, and he can build off of those and take the conversation in different directions he wants as well. Um, so first off, thank you for being here today. You're very much welcome, and thank you so much for having me on. Sure. So I've been curious, and Cliff has been curious, how did the Rational Politics Initiative come about? What were the forces that led to its genesis, if you will? Sure. So let me describe my background a little bit. Sure. I have a background in the history of behavioral science. So I'm a, I have a PhD in this field, and I'm at Ohio State University. I'm a professor there, and I've not been satisfied with the fact that academia orients toward the ivory tower. So mm-hmm. just kind of you know, for intellectuals, research, and so on, and teaching a small group of students, it keeping these ideas about behavioral science about how we can think most effectively orient toward reality and make wise decisions to reach our goals behind you know in the ivory tower has never been for me so about three years ago I started a nonprofit called intentional insights mm-hmm. at intentionalinsights.org for those listeners who want to check it out so again intentionalinsights.org and it's a nonprofit that basically popularizes the research in behavioral science how we can think and feel most effectively to achieve our goals and think rationally and so on, make wise decisions. That's the thing that, you know, it would be better for all of us to have more capacity to make good decisions. Absolutely. Now, <laughs> yeah, so we're doing a number of things there related to things like, say, decision-making in finances, decision-making in personal relation, in relationships and personal life, mental health that's a major area of focus so i'm a person who lives with mental illness so is my wife we co-founded the nonprofit. she has an mba in nonprofit management her name is agnes Vishnevkind. so she runs the back end of the nonprofit, and i'm more the front end hmm. and so uh we've been doing a number of things but uh, as we saw trump being nominated for the republican primary uh, in the republican primary uh, well as he became a mainstream candidate and he just cast out a lot of lies and deceptions we saw that this was going to be the area of most need for rational thinking because to mainstream the sort of lies and deceptions that trump is bringing has really really challenged our system of democracy and the potential for our system of democracy to continue Hmm. so we were very concerned about that right from the start and so we reoriented more toward politics, and that's kind of the rational politics project. How do you get people to actually evaluate reality accurately and make good decisions in the political sphere? So we did a lot of stuff in that area, and we're still doing a lot of stuff in that area. We're doing things like writing articles in Time, Scientific American, Psychology Today, Huffington Post, Daily Cause, plenty of other venues like this one, Great. and doing videos, podcasts, interviews. Now. We were hoping that we can wind it down after the election and focus on other things, but of course, the election was just as surprising to us as to so many other people, mm. with Trump being elected. So we decided to that we needed to keep and even intensify our focus on politics. So right now, about three quarters of our work is in politics, and that is when we were working on a specific intentional instrument mm. to change the dynamics and fight the lies and deceptions in our political system. And that's how we came up with the Pro-Truth Pledge. We were working on it from November, when Trump was elected, through through late March, when it was really rolled out. And that's when, that's what, that was the genesis of the Pro-Truth Pledge project. Great. So we, as you've touched upon a bit, we all know how common and normalized political lying is within United States society. Um, In your opinion, what is the impact of such lying on the the landscape of U.S. in general, and in particular, perhaps the political landscape? Sure. So I try to avoid relying simply on my opinion. I always strive to have my opinion supported by studies. Mm-hmm. So I started a recent study that was came out on the French political landscape with Marine Le Pen. Marine Le Pen is a far-right candidate 
who is similar to Trump in that she is a post-truth politician. Right. Post-truth politics has been chosen by Oxford Dictionary as the word of the year in 2016 okay. because of the U.S. election and the U.K. election where Brexit, where far-right conservative politicians use deceptive tactics in order to get Britain to you know, leave the EU. Similar dynamic there. Okay. So post-truth politics refers to a situation where um, appeals to personal beliefs and emotions overrides and wins out over appeals to facts. So Marine Le Pen is a far-right politician, mm -hmm. and she was using post-truth uh, tactics. And so there, there were a number of studies done. There was a study done on Marine Le Pen and how her post-truth tactics impacted the electorate. And the study showed that being exposed to alternative facts from Marine Le Pen caused people to believe in those alternative facts. So we have clear evidence that a people exposed to alternative facts, fake news and so on, believe in those things. Yeah. So that's a good scientific study that clearly demonstrates that. So we, now we know that, you know, we have, we previously could suppose that you know, people exposed to lies and deceptions would believe in them. Now we have evidence. Now, what about the US election? Well, BuzzFeed News uh, did a really good analysis of um, the fake news in the 2016 election are spread on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So they compared the top 20 fake news stories spread on, with, uh, that had engagements on Facebook, which means comments, shares, and likes of various sorts. And to the top 20 real news that had engagements on Facebook in the three months before the election. And they found that in that period of time, in the three months before the election, fake news actually outcompeted real news on Facebook. So you had something like 8 million engagements with fake news and 7 million something engagements with real news. Mm. So now we have a combination, uh, clear evidence that you have more fake news there out competing the real news ecosystem on uh, social media. And uh, we have clear evidence that people are strongly, are impacted by fake news. When they're exposed to it, they tend to have a belief in this fake news. Right. Another study that, show, that studied not the top 20 um, fake news stories, but all fake news stories, something like 156 fake news stories on Facebook, showed that uh, there was a total sharing of something like, in the three months before the election, something like un just under 40 million, like 38 million, 37 million fake news stories. Conservatives shared about 30 million or engaged with about 30 million fake news stories, and liberals engaged with about 7 million fake news stories. Wow. So we see that this is mostly, although far from all, a conservative phenomenon of right. fake news. And, I mean, liberals obviously have you know, 7 million engagements. It's not a small number, but conservatives have much more. You know, so this is, we see that this is a very prevalent phenomenon and that this is mostly so so far from all a conservative phenomenon. And so we see that fake news, we clearly now have evidence that fake news is a big thing. Fake right. news impacts people and it out competes real news and that conservatives engage in it to a far greater extent than liberals. So this is very concerning for the future of our country mm. and especially for the um, perspective of the liberal perspective, you know, how do we handle these fake news? So this was something very concerning to us. and. Yeah. It's a big, big concern because lies and deceptions would tend to lead our country into, you know, there are two big problems, well, three big problems. First of all, if people believe in lies, they can't make good decisions. Right. They can't, they don't have the right information, you know, garbage in, garbage out, as people say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, bad decisions are resulting from people believing in fake news. That's one. I mean, we see that over uh, half of all Republicans still believe that Trump won the popular vote. I mean, over half of Republicans believe that uh, Obama directed Trump Tower to be wiretapped in the 2016 election and other ridiculous things that caused them to make really bad decisions at the polling mm -hmm. And, of course, with their donations, with their votes, uh, you know, and with their volunteer time. So that's one. Second, fake news, belief in lies, is very likely to lead to a situation of corruption and authoritarianism. Why corruption? Well, if politicians aren't accountable to people, if they could just lie about corruption, then uh, they can be as corrupt as they want to be. Mm -hmm. And people just don't have a way of addressing them. And yeah. uh, we see that Trump's corrupt, Trump's modeling of fake news has already led other people to that. There's a senator, no, I'm sorry, there's a governor in Kansas, I believe, who, uh, 
has bought a house, a mansion, for about 1.6 million when its market price is about between 2.5 and 3 million. When the media started investigating that, and this was about two months ago, uh, a month or two ago, he started labeling these people as you know fake news and lies and deceptions. Hmm. And so, you know, <laughs> typical thing, there's plenty of corrupt people, you know, we have corrupt Democrats, we have corrupt Republicans, but this guy's a Republican, he's using Trump's tactics, you know, Democrats really wouldn't be able to get away with it, because this is Trump's tactics, uh, so we see that this is very conducive to corruption, and that uh, Trump's model is being adopted by the politicians. Yeah. So that's one. And second is authoritarians. So we know right now Trump's election commission has... Uh, called for all states to release their information, voting information to Trump, and of, you know he before the election took place, October 2016, when he thought he was losing, he said the election is going to be rigged. Now he is saying that you know he actually won the popular vote. Well, what's the likelihood that he'll, if he loses the 2020 election, that he'll actually step down versus double down and say no, all of these are lies. My my vote, my opponent actually won because of fake votes, and I'm not going to step down. I'm, I'm instead going to order Jeff Sessions to investigate this stuff. It's a constitutional crisis, and mm -hmm. it's quite likely that in that case he would be able to push through and remain president and then use the same techniques to give power to his selected, uh, you know, person who he would select handpick, you know, maybe a member of his family to mm -hmm. go on and hold the presidency. So this is uh, an authoritarian situation, and this is very mm -hmm. concerning, and it's all resulting from people believing in fake news and lies. That's a good connection you make between mainstreaming and mainstream acceptance of lies as a, as a tool that leads to authoritarianism. That's a good histor as a as a history teacher, that's a connection that I respect you making there. It's some that something that I've seen is something that uh, is always correlated with authoritarianism, if you will. With Absolutely, and we causality. see it right now <laughs> taking place in Turkey, where Erdogan is using the same post-truth tactics to become an authoritarian dictator in Turkey. We yeah. saw it take place a decade ago in Russia, where Vladimir Putin, you know, um, who is Trump's good friend. Uh, politically at least, mm -hmm. has uh, used the same tactics to take a demo pretty democratic country with freedom of media, freedom of speech, to an authoritarian one, where the government controls all the pretty much all the media, mm -hmm. and people don't really have much freedom of speech. We saw it earlier in other Western major democracies, uh, ones like Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, um, not France, Germany, and so this is a really situation that can easily take place in the United States. We're not special in that regard. Right. We see it from Trump, you know, being able to pardon himself from any crimes and so on. So that brings us to the Truth Pledge and us ordinary folks. What What is the value of the Truth Pledge to someone who's an ordinary person? Let's say they're more conservative, let's say they're more liberal. Uh, they, they see this. Why should they take the pledge? Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about what the what the pro-truth pledge is like. Sure. So for folks who are on uh, their computer, they can go to protruthpledge.org. Again, that's protruthpledge.org and check it out. So it's 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science suggests are correlated with an orientation toward the truth. And let me read some of them just to show you what Please. they're like for people who aren't, who buy their computer and can't go to approach of pledge at org. One is fact check information to confirm it is true before accepting it and sharing. Another is reevaluate if my information is challenged and retracted if I can't verify it. Mm -hmm. A third is ask people to retract information if reliable sources have disproved, even if those people are my allies. And a fourth is celebrate those who retract and correct statements and update their beliefs toward the truth. And there are eight more behaviors like this that anyone looking at it, pretty much anyone can agree, are oriented toward the truth. Mm -hmm. And this is what behavioral science suggests. Now, it takes about two minutes to go to ProTruthPledge.org and sign up. And the point of that, there are several points. One is that it's a simple casting of your vote for the truth. You cast your support, you show that you don't want corruption and authoritarianism to take over this country. That's you know a very easy and simple thing to do in two minutes. 
And there are a whole bunch of other things that have function that have a specific function. For people who are on the website, you can click on the orange button that says take the pledge and we can go through a long and I'll just read it, read out the relevant things for people who aren't on the website. So give your name, your email, and which will not be made public. You can opt out of newsletters if you want to do that, although I recommend you not, which I'll describe later. You give your home address, you can choose to give your address and your phone. The point of that is that so volunteers for the Pro Truth Pledge can go to your elected representatives and can say, hey, here is how many people in your district have taken the Pro Truth Pledge and have called on all of their elected representatives to take the Pro Truth Pledge, which is a box you can leave checked. Mm -hmm. Now, that essentially functions as a petition. It asks your elected representatives whether they're Republican, whether they're Democrat, whether they're third party, to take the approach of pledge and support it and endorse it and promote it and hold and stick to it. So that's one aspect. Then you can choose to provide a link to your Facebook profile. The reason for that is that we are going to create a public database of people who um, have taken the approach of pledge and want to be known as people who took the pro truth pledge and that will help you be more trusted and trustworthy by other people help you connect with people who took the pro truth pledge and just in general collaborate with people who you know are more likely to be oriented toward the truth then uh, you can choose to help with the pro truth pledge and choose to get updates about the pro truth pledge Great. now the reason that it's important to get updates about the pro truth pledge and action alerts is that we have the public figure action part of the Pro Truth Pledge. So that's for public figures. That's for podcast hosts like Miguel and Cliff. That's for commentators and analysts and authors like me. That's for your politicians, your elected representative, anyone from a council person, precinct officer, you know, local magistrate, to your state senator, to your mayor, to your uh, congressperson, senator, and so on. To Various prominent academics, you know, Peter Singer, Steven Pinker have taken the pro-truth pledge, and various other people, you know, uh, talk show hosts, like I mentioned, and, and so on, CEOs, nonprofit executives, and so on. So if they're public figures, they have an opportunity to say, to give their photograph for the public figures page, and then give a statement about why they chose to take the pro-truth pledge and up to three links. Now that's important because it goes on the Pro Truth Pledge public figure stage, and the public figure stage enables you to check which public figures have taken the Pro Truth Pledge. Okay. So you could see who you can trust, who you can rely on, and it also goes out in an email to all the people who took the Pro Truth Pledge. So the more people we have signed up, and e more importantly, just as importantly, the more people we have who are signed up to the emails, mm -hmm. the more we can go to public figures and say, hey, here are a number of people who signed up to the pro-truth pledge and who care about the truth. Would you like your information to be sent to them as someone who cares about the truth? Right. And we have a number of people who specifically sign up uh, for whom that's an incentive, who want the credibility of the pro-truth pledge, and they want their information to be sent to ordinary people like you who signed up to the pro-truth pledge. And that's crucial for that to be the case. For So the more people we sign up, the more incentives we have for more and more influential public figures to sign up. For example, I went to some public figures, a notable author and you know, a public intellectual who said that, hey, the behaviors of the pro truth pledge are kind of difficult to do, so until you have enough people, ordinary people who signed up and the, the pledge becomes worth it for me to send my information to them and to be listed, I'm not going to sign up. Right. So the more people we have signed up, the more incentive public figures will have to sign up. So okay. that's kind of the carrots. We also have the accountability mechanism, which I can talk through, but that's the point for public figures. They sign up to the Pro-Truth Pledge, they put a Pro-Truth Pledge badge on their website, there's an accountability mechanism to make sure they stick all accountable, and the benefit for you as a private citizen of signing up is to make sure that more and more public figures sign up. Excellent. You know, mentioning, I'm glad that you started to talk about the public figures, and while you're doing that, I... I showed the Pro Truth Pledge and highlighted certain elements on the screen briefly while you were talking through it. Um, I, I know two local politicians that are independent progressives, I guess. You know, so more towards uh, what the Green Party in the United States looks like. They're about, that's where they're politically oriented in, in a way. And um, one of them was leaving being a vice mayor and a city council member for years and is going to run for the California District 15. 
in the state nice. assembly. And she expressed interest in the pledge when I brought it up to her. She's like, her campaign manager got involved and said, oh, we're going to look into this. We're going to do this. Um, mm -hmm. While another person who's running for the lieutenant governor of California said, I like it. I respect it. But to me, it represents something that's too mainstream and not accountable. There, there isn't that accountability there. And you mentioned mm -hmm. the accountability mechanism. So when yeah. you have a naysayer, some of them may be listening to this podcast right now. What can you say about the accountability mechanisms that can ensure them that this is something that's worth their time? Sure. So we have a very clear accountability mechanism. And for folks, for folks who are by the computer, I would encourage you to go on the Pro Truth Pledge website back on the main page and take a look at the FAQ 2 and 3. The FAQ 2 is called What is Considered Misinformation? So what is considered a violation of the pro-truth pledge, basically? There are three things. So three things. One is basically anything uh, that something that we can all agree is a lie. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not a Chinese woman broadcasting from Hawaii right now. You know, that's you know that's an, that's an obvious lie. Yes, that's something we can all agree on. So that's something you know. In the same way that um, you know Donald Trump didn't win the popular vote, lots of Republicans are calling him out, and it's not only like Democrats. Yeah, he, that's an obvious one. So, you know, obvious lines, stuff like that. Or, you know, to take a, uh, a liberal example, Hillary Clinton didn't land under sniper fire in Bosnia. That was called <laughs> out by Washington Post as a lie, and she later admitted that it's a lie. Sure. So, an, obvi an obvious lie, from a democratic perspective. Okay. Now, we also uh, go to fact-checking websites. Another kind of violation of the approach of pledge if it is if something goes against a credible fact-checking website. We basically, to avoid accusations of bias, we're going with the same fact-checking websites that Facebook is going with. Facebook has a huge incentive for its fake news checking program to use only the most credible and reliable websites that you know are neutral in terms of conservative or liberal. They're just credible, high-quality fact-checking websites. And they think the last ones include things like PolitiFact, Snopes, FactCheck.org, AP FactCheck, and ABC News FactCheck. That's the latest ones that I remember Facebook is using. So something that goes against those. And a third is the scientific consensus. So we have the science, science is the best method that we as human beings have of discovering the truth. So if there's a clear scientific consensus on something, for example, that global warming is, there's significant global warming caused by humans, that's a clear scientific consensus that a major, that large majority of climate change scientists agree on, that scientific organizations agree on, and that uh, meta-analysis review papers. Okay. So someone going against that would be in violation of the pro-truth pledge. Now, what happens if someone is in violation of the pro-truth pledge? That's the third FAQ. How are pledge takers held accountable? Okay. So for public figures, there is a three-level accountability mechanism. So first, anyone who takes the pro-truth pledge and volunteers to help, so the checkbox that says, the checkbox that says volunteered help, one of the things they can do is monitor public figures. So they can immediately monitor public figures who took the pro-truth pledge. And if a public figure does something that violates one of the three points about there, it's an obvious lie, credible fact-checking websites, and the consensus, they can approach that person behind the scenes privately. We ask, you know, not to make a big deal about it. The point is you don't want the lieutenant governor to be nervous about, like, oh, will they be people spreading rumors around me and, you know, calling me out publicly. We want people to feel safe mm -hmm. that they will be approached behind the scenes and that their reputation will not be damaged immediately. So you go behind the scenes, you approach that person privately, and you say, hey, or uh, her or his staff, and say, hey, can you clarify this? I wasn't sure about this. I'm confused. You know, did the, gover did the lieutenant governor misspeak? Or did, you know, did I mishear it? Can you clarify this? Mm -hmm. And if the lieutenant governor, you know, retracts the statement, that's great. We celebrate updating. That's one of the points of the pledge. If they clarify the same thing. Now, if that doesn't happen, then well, we go to a mediating committee. And here's where we're borrowing. This is essentially a method of crowdsourcing the truth. We're borrowing a method that Wikipedia uses. And Wikipedia is well known for having very, very accurate analysis of the... So they're more accurate than many encyclopedias, like Encyclopedia Britannica and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have a two-level mechanism. The second mechanism is people who are well vetted, who have been in the movement in the pro-truth movement for a while. In the same way that Wikipedia has a level 
uh, that they call editors or given editorial access who can lock an article for, for editing and so on and who can determine the actual reality of a situation if it's a partisan issue and two people are kind of battling it out, two groups are battling it out. So what happens there is that we have a meeting committee that evaluates the situation. So the approach of Pledge Advocate Volunteer brings the information about the violation to the mediating committee and the mediating committee evaluates the situation. And then the mediating committee approaches the politician, gives the politician or another public figure a number of chances to retract or clarify their statements. The lieutenant governor would have many opportunities to have to talk to the mediating committee, retract the statement, and so on. Now, if the lieutenant governor chooses not to retract or clarify the statement, and the mediating committee still believes this is a violation of the pro-truth pledge based on one of the three points above, that's when we would go public. We would send an um, action alert to all the people in California, since this is California, the Lieutenant Governor of California, all the people in California who signed the approach of pledge, which is why it's so important to have action, to sign up for action alerts. We would send all the information about the Lieutenant Governor or candidate for Lieutenant Governor violating the approach of pledge. And since she or he refused to retract the information, they are now in contempt of the approach of pledge. It's not a big deal. Anyone can violate it. Anyone can make a mistake. It's, it's okay. The point is to retract the statement if you don't, if it's inaccurate. And if you don't, after a number of tries, you're in contempt of the approach of pledge. Mm -hmm. So we send an action alert asking people to tweet the lieutenant governor, email the lieutenant governor, call the lieutenant governor, meet with the lieutenant governor, protest the lieutenant governor's office, and basically make a big stink about the situation, write letters to the editor, and so on. That's one. Second, we send a media release to all the relevant news stations in California about the situation. And we list the lieutenant governor as in contempt of the pro truth pledge on the pro truth pledge website. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big reputational hit. So yeah. someone who intends to uh, lie is better off not signing the pro truth pledge at all. So that's the accountability mechanism we have. And, and it went, we already have an example where a candidate for Congress, Michael Smith in Idaho, okay. um, posted something on his Facebook wall. Uh, of a tweet by Donald Trump that said, oh, you know, minority kids um, may be too disruptive for the classroom, don't belong there. And it wasn't in Donald Trump's feed, so he, uh, you know, maybe Donald Trump deleted it, or maybe it was photoshopped to look like Donald Trump's uh, tweet. And by the time he, you know, got to this, he already had something like 18 shares, because, you know, he's a candidate, he's a public figure sure. for Congress. And so uh, he retracted the statement, uh, said that he added the statement to say, because of a pro-truth pledge I've taken, I can no longer support the accuracy of the statement. So that's ideally how the pro-truth pledge works. That's the ideal mechanism. Somebody posts something that they believe is true without intending to lie or deceive. Mm -hmm. And then we get to that person and say, hey, can you clarify this? That person is like, oh, oops, my bad. I'm going to retract it. And we're like, yay, go you, celebrate update. Right. So that's the mechanism. And that's the accountability mechanism that we have. And that's an example of how it worked in the past. That's excellent. Um, so I read on the site how you initially, within the Rational Politics Initiative, had sort of the the short-term goals, which I guess you've gotten through, and are now in the mid-range goals and heading towards the long-term goals. Could you um, inform us, um, in particular our audience, a little bit more about what those goals are? Sure. So the short-term goals is to kind of clarify the project itself, what it will involve, and we have gone kind of through that. Now we're going into the medium-term goals, which involves building up uh, a network of organizers throughout the country. Okay. So we have a number of network of organizers that includes uh, people in California, let's say, and right now we're building up a network of organizers everywhere. The goal is to have not only target kind of national level, federal level politicians, but all state level politicians, everyone at local level politicians and other public figures to get as many people as possible signed up to the pro pledge, ordinary people. You know, doing things like going to political events, going to community fairs, telling them about the approach of pledge and getting them to sign the approach of pledge. We, and that's kind of, you know, what the ground level organizers are doing. They're also creating community of people who took the approach of pledge. You know, it's nice to be in a community of people who you know are dedicated to the truth above all, 
that's right. a kind of a, a very nice feeling to have. So kind of creating a community around the approach of pledge for people who can trust each other and who can work on this project together. And lobby politicians would do this and other public figures to take the approach of pledge and then monitor them once they lobby them. So and once they lobby them and once they take the approach of pledge. And that's the aspiration. So right now we're focusing on building up the network throughout the United States. We are starting to expand it to Canada as well. And uh, so we are aiming to, again, focusing right now a lot on the network of organizers. We want to set up a network to be prepared for the 2018 election. And we figure that's going to be the first major test of the approach of pledge. So for example, here in Ohio, I live in Ohio District 12, and we have a number of volunteers here. So uh, we have gotten, there's the District 12, the congressional race, there are five candidates running for this race, mm -hmm. three Republicans and two Democrats. Okay. And we have the two Democrats uh, have taken the pledge, so has one Republican. One Republican said that he will very likely do so. I will meet with him soon for him to do so. And the last Republican has indicated that he doesn't, uh, has not indicated that he wants to take the pledge. Okay. So the next step here, and we're, you know, because this is the most developed area, we're figuring out the tactics here. We're going to go to the news and and say, hey, here are four republic, four you know, four candidates out of five have taken the pro truth pledge. One candidate has not. Mm -hmm. You know, are you interested in writing up a story about this? Yeah. So that's going to be uh, the next step of kind of publicizing things after we get enough candidates in the race who took the pro truth pledge. Brilliant. I really like that grassroots level uh, accountability. It, it, it's sort of going with a lot of independent organizations that have popped up over the past mm -hmm. year, year and a half, you know, like the um, the brand new Congress or the Justice Democrats, um, mm -hmm. you know, different, different people's movements to really just try to exercise citizens or the, the general populace's control over the representatives who claim to represent us as their title implies. So it's really good to see this as, as part of that very important movement, which is, you know, why Cliff and I wanted to interview you. And it's, it's fantastic that this is going on. And um, I was wondering if, do you have any sort of um, uh, parting messages or do you want to mention something that I haven't asked as a question that you think would be useful for the audience to hear, a uh, call to action perhaps, or anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I want to, uh, again, encourage everyone who is listening to us right now to go to protruthpledge.org and sign up. And it takes two minutes. You cast your vote for truth in politics. Now you get to join the community of people who are oriented toward the truth. And you get to hold politicians accountable. You know, at the minimal level of involvement, it's just two minutes of your time. And it makes such a big impact on politicians elsewhere because we'll have... Even if you don't choose to volunteer, we'll have other people who volunteer. And you know, you can always support it by donating if you don't have time. If you have time, please volunteer and lobby your politicians, get other people to take the pro-truth pledge. It, the nice thing about it is that, uh, as uh, Miguel said, you know, there are a number of grassroots organizations. And ours is, while most people tend to be liberal, we also have conservatives and moderates on board. Uh, and they are very enthusiastic about collaborating together to make a big tent approach to really orient toward the truth above all and truth is not a conservative or a liberal thing it's a thing that everyone can agree on is you know, accurate evaluation of reality so getting people on all sides of the spectrum of the political spectrum to agree on the truth is the aspiration of the pro-truth pledge and hopefully we can get our politics in a better shape by just having this grassroots movement of getting people to orient toward and agree on the truth. And I'd like you uh, to check with uh, you, Miguel, if you think Justice Democrats as an organization might be interested in joining the Pro-Truth Pledge. We had a number of organizations that chose to take the Pro-Truth Pledge as an organization and commit to the Pro-Truth Pledge. So I'm curious what you think about that. I think that's a good direction to go. I think once um, Cliff gets back from his holiday, I think we'll we'll definitely look at that. And Cliff has some more contacts within uh, 
the organization itself. And I think I, I definitely know that's something that we'll we'll choose to do. So that's wonderful. That's a good that's a good um call to action for us as a podcast to make sure that we leverage that the Justice Democrats does that. I think that will serve them well and allow them to enhance the reputation and credibility with the demographic that they're looking for, which is basically anyone in the United States who's rational minded. <laughs> so Yeah. Uh, and that's not why a number of groups who are oriented toward the truth and hold that as an important value have chosen to take the pro truth pledge as an organization. And uh, so sticking to that as an organization for all statements made from the perspective of the organization, tweets, press releases, whatever, to be abide by the pro truth pledge. Cool. Excellent. I will look forward to chatting to you further about that. And thank you so much for the interview. This was great. Yeah, well, so, well, that's it for our interview, I guess. And um, so thank you, Gleb Siporsky, uh, as the coordinator for the Rational Politics Initiative and the pro truth pledge. Um, make sure you do check out his website, I guess if they just go to glebsiporsky.com, mm -hmm. is that, okay, so G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y.com, and mm -hmm. I think they can access all the information on the Pro-Truth Pledge and the Rational Policy Initiative through there. Um, so thanks for joining us.